Good morning. Uh, today we're going to cover the uh, second part of Weld 1760. If you'll recall from our first lecture on Weld 1760, we covered welding electrodes and the AWS identification system. Uh, this time we're going to talk about some of the jobs. By this time, Jeff Brager and I have been in the welding booth with you. We've, we've helped you uh, do a little bit on the vertical up welding and the overhead welding. Uh, what I want to do now is go over parts of chapter 13, 14, and 15, some particular jobs that I want you to pay attention to. And I want you to read the information that your book has in here regarding uh, their recommended practices for welding vertical up and overhead using 6010 and 7018. Uh, you're going to find that, that some of the things they do are a little bit different than what Jeff and I do. Uh, but there's really no wrong way to, to, to do this welding as long as you meet the essential code requirements of the weldman. So uh, in the booth I want you to do it how I'm telling you, but I also want you to ex expand your horizons a little bit and glean some information from, from these chapters we're going to cover today. Now as with previous chapters, there may be some questions on your test that you can't turn to a particular page in your book and say, aha, there's the answer, because I'm going to give you the answer standing up here, so I expect you to take notes. And I'm going to give you a heads up right now because there's going to be a question coming from, from page 426 in your textbook. That's where we're going to start. If you want to turn, turn to that page now, and I want you to look at job 13-J18. That's stringer beating. And once you get there, uh, read along with me. We're on page 426. And it says, objective. To deposit stringer beads on flat steel plate in the vertical position, travel up with DCEP or AC using shielded metal arc welding electrodes, and they're going to use 6010 or 6011. We're going to use 6010. And so what they want you to do is just take a piece of flat steel like this, and you're going to strike an arc at the bottom and, and go in a vertical up progression. If you remember from one of our previous talks, uh, I mentioned that if you have a material in a vertical position like this, you have to specify is it vertical up or vertical down. Everything you've done so far is going to be vertical up. Uh, now here's what I want you to highlight and put a bullet by because there will be a question on this from your test, for your test. It says under general job information, for the most part, vertical welding is done by traveling up, especially on critical work. Pressure piping, shipbuilding, pressure vessels, and structural steel are some of the fields of welding using this procedure. So on critical work, the progression is going to be vertical up instead of vertical down. Now, you see these pipeline trucks running around here, and, and they run vertical down. Uh, and you can have qualified welding procedures for running vertical down. But if it's critical stuff, they're going to want you to run vertical up. On pipe, you'll start at the bottom down here, and you'll come up this way. And there's a reason for this, and this is what I want you to remember. The reason is, when you're welding vertical up, more heat is generated, and you can have a greater depth of fusion into the base metal. Your, your welding rod is going to dig into that base metal a lot more if you're trying to travel vertical up than if you're moving vertical down. So that's the main reason for it. You have a greater depth of fusion. And you'll find a question on your test related to that information, so make sure you make notes of that. Um, go to the next page here, and up at the top, Look at figure 1369. As I mentioned before, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Uh, there's more than one way to make a weld. And what they've done here in this figure is given you some different ways that you can manipulate your welded electrode. You can see you can have a steady push, uh, which we would recommend if we were doing, uh, putting a stringer bead in the pipe. Uh, sometimes we'd use a slight whip, a whipping motion, and you're practicing that now. You can use a J motion or an inverted T. There are situations where we would use an inverted T. You could use a box weave. Now, when we're, when we're doing a weave, and the weave that Jeff and I are teaching you is the Z weave. And then you have the proper J going in the other direction, and then a little circular motion. Some of you may have been taught the circular motion in high school. It's pretty popular among high school vocational education instructors. So take a look at that and experiment with them as you're going through this class. Okay, now reading from uh, welding techniques just below that figure, 
it says current adjustment must not be too high. You're going to tilt the electrode downward about 5 to 15 degrees. Now when they're talking about tilting it downward, you want to point the nose in the air. So this is what they mean. And when, if I'm working you, with you in the welding booth, booth, I'll probably tell you to drop your hands or increase the rod angle. That's, those are the terms that I like to use. But your book is referring, when it says down angle, they're, they're talking about it's actually, the tip's actually going to be leading the, the, the butt, like so. So you want to have an up angle on that, and then in relationship to the, to, the, to the plate, this way or this way, you want to make sure that it's at 90 degrees, like so. So we have a 5, 10 or 15 degree down angle, but 90 degrees uh, transverse to it. So that's what you want to have. And then it says the basic welding motions used in vertical welding when you're traveling up are shown in figure six, 1369. Those are the ones that we just talked about. Figure 1370 illustrates the actual welding position. Now when you do that, if, that's the pictures over there on the, uh, on the right hand side. Uh, it says when you're doing this now, the arc gap should be short when depositing the weld metal. So you want to keep it in there nice and tight so you have a good consistent uh, arc. Uh, some welders, I'm dropping down here a couple of, couple of sentences and reading, it says some welders prefer to move the electrode back and forth slightly as it is advanced so that it stays in the molten puddle. And we would call this an oscillation. Some welders will do this as they're, as they're moving up and down with it. Just a slight oscillation, similar to the whip that we've been teaching you. Um, the whipping technique, as you know, you don't want to move too far out of the puddle. Uh, so that you don't rob it of, of the shielding gases that are generated by the melting of the flux on here. But that slight oscillation gives you some advantages in, in terms of puddle control. And then, uh, let's see, finally up in the right hand corner under figure 1368, you can see that, that they're uh, uh, illustrating here the rocking motion of, of the electrode as they're moving it up and down. Then flip the page to job number 19, and on this one they want you to do a weave. And you're still going to use the same welding rod, E6010, but now you're going to do a weave. So let me read from where it says general job information under job 13-J19. It says, when welding in the vertical position, and when it is necessary to weave the bead, the direction of travel is usually up. This technique is used on pressure piping and pressure vessels and in shipbuilding and structural welding. DC electrode positive electrodes are generally selected. The travel up method is employed in the welding of multipass groove and fillet welds in the vertical position. And over on the next page it reads, current adjustment must not be too high, but the arc must be hot enough to ensure good fusion. Tilt the electrode downward ab about 10 degrees from the horizontal position. Uh, figure 13-73A shows that, uh, figure A, that's down here on the bottom right hand corner, and hold it at 90 degrees to the plate. So it's, your rod angle is going to be virtually identical to the one that we used for the single position, for the single bead. Um, now a shelf is formed at the bottom of the plate that is the desired width of the, of the weldment. So if we have a plate and we want to do a weave up, well we've been teaching you the Z motion. And as you come across from one side to the next, the metal is building up here, and then this is the shelf that your book is talking about. As you go back across, the next layer lays on that shelf. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And as you, as you recall from me talking with you, and probably with Jeff talking with you too, once over and once back, you only move forward, you only advance about the diameter of the welding electrode. If you advance too far on this, you're going to get what we call butterfly wings. You'll look at your bead and your bead will look like this. And what that means is you come over and then you advance too far. And you, by advancing too far, you leave these little gaps in here. Whereas what it should be, it should come out, it should look up more like this, to where you have virtually a straight edge. And uh, this is where you've overlapped them enough. If you see this appearance on your welds, you're advancing too fast, too far, and you're not overlapping the previous shelf enough. Okay, let's go back to your book. And it's, uh, let me pick up where it says shelf. A shelf is formed at the bottom of the plate that is the desired width and height. 
weave the electrode across the face of the weld, hesitating at the sides of the weld to eliminate any undercut. If you don't pause, then you're not going to allow enough of that welding rod to melt to fill in where the arc is gouged that base metal out. So you want to pause, let some welding rod melt, so it'll fill it in. Uh, you may advance the weld by keeping the electrode in the pool, but be careful that the molten metal does not become so fluid that it spills out. Uh, you can create a localized hot spot by moving too slowly with it. And uh, if you remember from me working with you in the welding lab, you'd sweep across the middle and pause on the sides. It's the sides where all the work is done. Uh, when this occurs, run the electrode up on either side of the weld, and that'll help to draw off some of that excess heat. Lengthen the arc, but do not break it. Do not keep the arc out of the crater any longer than is necessary since the crater, because it would allow the crater to cool and causes excess spatter ahead of the weld. Remember that undercut is the gouging out of the base metal by the arc over a wider surface than is being covered by the welding deposit. Do not weave the electrode beyond the desired width of the bead. And that's one thing that people have a tendency to, to, to do. They have a tendency to weave it too wide. You don't want to weave it too wide. Most books that you'll read say a maximum of five times the diameter of the welded electrode that you're using. You don't want to weave it any wider than that. Uh, okay, that's the end for that one. Let's turn to page 432. And this would be job J21. Now it says here a lap joint. Well, we don't do lap joints, we do T joints. So I want you to do a T joint. Uh, in, in place of that lap, and I want you to use, make sure you're using a whip and 6010. Now under general job information, drop down to almost the end of that first paragraph, and where it reads, the first bead that you deposit, here we're going to be doing a multi-pass, uh, pardon me, a single pass, the first bead should be put into the root with good penetration. You want to make sure that you really gouge in. Remember 6010, its purpose in life is, is to gouge into the base metal. So you want to make sure you're gouging into that base metal and fusing both pieces. Uh, the second bead should fuse thoroughly into three-fourths of the first bead and extend one quarter of an inch out from the bottom plate. So this is, this is a multi-pass. The third bead should fuse with the first two and extend to the edge of the top plate. Um, they don't give us an example here. Uh, but what they're talking about and this is the same stuff that you practiced in uh, 1755. If you look at the bead, like so, your first bead is going to lay in here, and you're going to make sure that you have the same amount of metal on each plate, and you're going to make sure that you get good depth of fusion into those two plates. Then your second bead, and it doesn't matter which side you go up for your second bead, you make that decision. Your second bead should cover most of that first bead, like so. And you want to make sure that you're getting good depth of fusion over here and that you're covering most of the number one bead. And then your number three bead will cover one half of the number two bead. And you want to make sure that you're getting good depth of fusion here and also good depth of fusion into the previous beads that have been deposited. That's how you get a strong weld. And this can all be tested in what they call a fillet weld break, which is a test that I'll, I'll get to in a little bit. So keep that in mind, read that information, understand how your book wants you to do it. It's real close to the way we like to do it. Then under welding technique, drop to the bottom of that column there on page 432. And it says, uh, they're talking about a circular motion. It says you can keep the circular, elect pardon me, keep the electrode motion within the confines of the weld, uh, weld width so that the edge of the upper plate is not burned away and so that undercut does not occur on the surface of the lower plate. Now again, they're talking about, uh, they're talking about uh, a lap joint, and uh, they, don't, they want the, don't want that upper edge to burn away. Remember that a, that a lap joint, and you should remember this definition, are two pieces of plate that are lying in, in a plane and overlapping one another. So, so if we were actually doing a true lap joint as this, this is describing, we'd go like that, and then we'd go like that, and then we'd go like that. And they don't want this upper edge to be burned away too much, and that's what they're talking about now. A lap joint, it does have its place in, in, uh, in the workplace, and you're going to run into that quite a bit. You'll be doing some lap joints in, in your career, but for the purpose of utilizing our material to the best advantage, uh, we don't do lap joints. We, we do all T joints. 
Okay, that's everything in chapter 13. So now I want you to turn to page 448 in chapter 14. 448. Okay, what I wanted to do here, this is really kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit um, because there's some more vertical stuff that we're going to do, but this is the order of presentation that your book has it in, so I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that here they're going to have you practice overhead welding with Stringer Beach using 6010. Job uh, 14-J26 is a Stringer Bead in the overhead position. So you can see, if you look down at the bottom of the page there, at figure 14.4, it shows us the welding, the welding rod here and, and the arc transfer in the overhead position. And again, all of these different uh, electro manipulation techniques that you can use. So I'd like you to read over their, their method of welding overhead and compare it to the ones that Jeff and I are teaching you in the welding lab. And if you'll turn the page, we have job 14-J27, and it's a weave bead in the overhead position. So again, I want you to read on that, read the information they have, and how they talk about keeping a short arc and pausing on the sides and so forth for that. Um, then go to page 469. Still in chapter 14, page 469, and we're back to vertical again. Job 14-J35 is welding a T-joint using a single pass. Now remember the first two jobs we talked about back in, uh, back in chapter 13, those were simply stringer beads on flat plate. Now we're going to do an actual T-joint. So the objective here is to weld a T-joint in the vertical position by means of a single pass fillet weld with travel up using DC, EP, or AC. We're going to use a 6010 rod because uh, 6010, remember from our electrode identification system, uh, we know that these numbers mean, the first two mean tensile strength, the third one means position, and the last one means um, flux coating. What's in that flux? And also it's electrical characteristics. Okay, so they're listing 6010 and 6011 because 6010 runs on DC, 6011 runs on AC, and that's really the only difference between the two. So we're going to use 6010 running on DC. Drop down and read where it says welding technique, and it says current adjustment should be high enough to ensure good fusion and penetration to the root of the joint and to the plate surfaces. Hold the electrode at a 45 degree work angle to the plates. Figure 14-38A uh, shows that, and it says tilt it no more than 10 degrees in a, in a push travel angle. So this is push. We're going to be pushing it up, up like so. And of course, I'll, I'll be wanting you to use the, we, uh, the whip technique. And your book a little later, later on gets into the whip technique. Uh, what they're using here is pretty much a straight push, what they're describing here. Um, figure 14-39 shows the actual welding position and if you look at that picture just off to the right there you can see they've got a they've got a T-joint set up and they have one eighth inch diameter that circle with a line through it means diameter E6010 so they're using the same rod that you are and they're welding in the 3F position and you can see that he's got a T-joint but he's also got it hooked up to, uh, with a lap joint underneath so there's actually two types of welds that he can make there so use the familiar up and down motion recommended for the vertical, uh, vertical position. It is necessary to leave the crater at short intervals to prevent the metal from becoming overheated. So he says you're actually going to clear the, uh, the weld puddle with this so that you don't get, generate too much heat right there. And remember that when you do that, it, when you come out of there, it preheats in front of where you're going. Then you come back, you pause in the puddle until you've deposited the amount of metal you want, and then you back out again. So it's whip, come back, pause, out, come back, pause, out, come back, pause. Uh, you never want to whip it so far away that 
that you're robbing that molten puddle of the gaseous shield, the protection it's getting from, from that flux melting off the electrode. So you only want to whip it out just a little ways, maybe a couple of diameters of the electrode, and that's about it. And you don't want to pull it away too far from the plate when you're whipping this. It should be more of a sliding motion. When you pull it away like this, then that just increases the amount of, uh, of spatter that you're going to get everywhere. Now it says overheating makes it spill off and run down. Hold a close arc gap when depositing metal. The arc gap can be lengthened on the downward motion, but it must not be broken. Uh, this arc technique, this long arc technique is referred to as the whipping, as whipping the electrode. Okay, drop down to, uh, in that same column to where it says, if your machine does not let the welding amperage drop off, you will need to maintain a short arc length and just use an upward motion in and out of the weld puddle to control the penetration, undercut, and weld profile. Read that column there because it talks about the differences in welding machines. Some welding machines aren't made to allow you to use that kind of a whipping technique, but some are. Ours are. And then finally, practice your starts and stops. So read that information. When we have this written test for this thing, uh, there will be some questions coming from all of this. I'm going to pick and choose, and it'll be multiple choice, um, probably a 20-question test for this. Next page, 471. Uh, job 14-J36. What we're going to do now is weld a T-joint in the vertical position by means of multi-pass fillet welds. Uh, using a weave technique and traveling up. So what they want to do here is uh, they're gonna, you're going to strike an arc and run your first bead and then you're going to put another wider one on top of that weaving directly over. Now uh, I know Jeff likes to, likes to do that um, and that's fine. I like to do a couple of stringer beads over top of it. If, if I'm working with you I'll probably have you do this three pass fillet weld and then we'll put a weave over top of it. Well that's not the only way you can do it. You can also do it like your book describes and put put one bead in there and then weave a second bead in there and then maybe even weave a third bead in there. And this, that, this is what your book, book is going to describe right now. So you can do it this way. But again uh, for utilizing material properly I like to go like this, and also it's easier to weave if you're weaving wider. It's kind of hard to weave over a single bead. Uh, it can overheat on you real easy, so that's why I like to use this technique. Hey, going back to your book now, it says, um, under general job information, for practical purposes, a joint in one quarter inch plate would not require three passes. Three passes are required in this job to permit full use of the plate and develop the ability to weld weave beads in the vertical position. Multiple fillet welds in the vertical position are usually welded up with the electrode positive uh, electrodes, with electrode positive electrodes. So whenever you're making a fillet weld, a good rule of thumb is to never have the weld metal thicker than the base metal, uh, especially if, you have, if it's going to be a test and you, and you have to break that for a fillet weld break test. It's going to be virtually impossible to break that weld if you have more weld on there than metal, if the metal is simply going to bend. So uh, you don't want to ever overweld. Overwelding can be a huge problem. It can cause distortion and cracking in the weld. So read about your welding technique. Second pass, use the front, use the joint from the previous job. Again, utilizing material. So uh, use the joint that you started and weld uh, for, for J35 to, to do your second pass on. And then you're going to use a weave bead for your second pass. And I'm reading from uh, about halfway down this column. It says, you will find that it is possible to keep the electrode in the weld pool and advance it by weaving from side to side. A smooth, even motion across the face of the weld will form a flat face, and hesitation at the sides of the weld will prevent undercut. Hold a short arc gap, but do not touch the molten metal with the electrode. Uh, now, I've, under, I've underlined this because uh, I thought it was relatively important. In welding both the second and the third pass, the upward movement when you reach the bead edges controls the appearance and the thickness of the bead being deposited. So as you reach the edge side to side, remember we've always talked about hesitating, pausing. That's where the work is done. So your book is simply reinforcing what we're teaching you in the lab. A large upward movement will result in wider spaced ripples and thinner buildup like I've shown you here, wagon tracks. See they've got these spaced too wide. 
So it's a thinner weld. And then looking back at your book, it says, a small upward movement will produce more closely spaced ripples and a thicker buildup. So you're going to deposit more metal in a smaller space. Okay? So when you're done, your weld ought to come out, the edges ought to, ought to be straight. You, you should be able to just about put a ruler on it and it'll be straight. Third pass. Um, your book here wants you to go to a larger electrode, which is, you know, that's fine if that's how they want to do it. I'm going to want you to stay with, with the eighth inch. But they do come in larger electrodes. This is 6010, 5P plus, just like you're using, 1 8 inch. Um, this is five, uh, 5 30 seconds, so the next size up, okay? It, that's fine. You can, weld, you can weld stuff with this, and if you want to try some, feel free to try it. We're not going to test you on that, but you can get used to using larger electrodes if you, it, while you're here and practicing. And then here, here we have a 3 16 electrode. Now look at the size of that. So compare these three welding rods, and you can see 8 inch, 532, 3 16 all of these sizes are used in pipeline welding. And the farther out they go, they want to get that weld done, so they'll go to the thicker, the thicker welding rods. But of course, in pipeline welding, they're welding vertical down. Um, these rods can be used vertical up, the larger ones, but it takes practice and it takes some skill. And just a little caveat, a little uh, anecdote from my own career. I saw a guy fired from a job one time because he was using a smaller rod when the company wanted him to use a bigger rod. And they thought he was farming the job, that he was milking it out to try to make it to the end of the day. And that wasn't the only problem he had, but, but it, it kind of angered the bosses a little bit, and so they, they, they used that as an excuse to fire him. So, of course, you're going to do whatever your boss wants you to do. But uh, for the purposes of what you're learning here, I want you to stick with the eighth-inch welding electrodes, uh, welding this out. And, uh, as I say, if you want to practice with the bigger ones, feel free. Okay. Next, we're going to move to the next page and look at job 37. In this one now, they're finally jumping over and using 7018. Everything we've talked about up to this point has been 6010. Now we're going to do, go to use 7018 welding rod. And uh, for 7018, they want you to weld the T-joint in the vertical position by means of multi-pass fillet welds, weave bead technique, travel up, using low hydrogen, iron powder, shielded metal arc electrodes. AWS E7018. Uh, here's our job description. The addition of 25 to 40 percent iron powder to a low hydrogen electrode covering has increased its usage for mild steel and the low alloy, high sulfur, and high carbon grade steels. Iron powder also increases the deposition rate and gives better restrike characteristics than E7016 types. Uh, the arc action is smoother and more stable, and you know that from having run it. You know that it, it doesn't produce nearly as much, much spatter, and it's a much easier rod to run. The, the deposit wets more readily uh, so that so that it, pre it helps prevent undercutting. When it says wets, it, you can look, there's, a, there's a, an appendix in the back of your text that will give you that definition, but let me read it. It says, wetting is bonding or spreading of a liquid metal on a solid metal base. So it, can, it flows really well. Uh, so that's what they mean by wetting. And it says, the bead is smoother and slag removal is easier than with most E7016 electrodes. And all of the desirable low hydrogen characteristics are retained with this electrode. So if you remember back to our discussion of, of welding electrodes, we know that the low hydrogen ones contain iron powder. In particular, this one contains about 25 percent iron powder. When you strike the arc and you run that weld, that iron powder melts, becomes part of the weld metal. So it's a higher deposition. There's a really nice picture right there adjacent to where we've been reading. It says figure 1444. And here they've done weave beads using uh, 7018, and you can look, they've, they've done a three-pass vertical up weave bead on there, and that just looks really, really nice. Okay, uh, flip the page. It says welding technique. It says use AC or DCEP. You will find that the arc is smooth and quiet with shallow penetration, a little spatter. Since the coating of these electrodes is heavier than normal, Vertical and overhead welding is usually limited to smaller diameter electrodes. They'll use the smaller ones. Um, I've done a lot of pipe welding, and I don't think I've ever used anything larger than 532. 
Uh, typically, it's 332 and 1 8 inch welding electrodes. Uh, currents used are somewhat higher than for the E60 types for the corresponding sizes. So if we have a stick of a stick of 7018 eighth inch and a stick of 330 uh, 7018, pardon me, 6010 eighth inch, 7018 eight, eighth inch. You can see they're both the same size, but because the iron powder, the, uh, the 7018 is physically larger. So you have to increase the amperage on your machine to to melt the additional material. Um, dropping down, your book suggests using a small triangular weave instead of the Z weave that we've been teaching you. Feel free to practice with that and experiment with that. It says point the electrode directly into the joint and slightly upward to permit the arc to force the arc force to assist in controlling the pull. Travel slowly enough to maintain the shelf without causing the molten metal to spill off. Use currents in the lower portion of the quoted range. Keep the width of the weave within the confines of the bead width. Remember, don't, don't go too far with it. Now, 7018 produces a lot of slag. You've got to clean between the passes. Okay? If, uh, trap slag creates a discontinuity which can, which can lead to weld failure. And of course, trap slag will show up on an x-ray film, and that would be a rejection if, it, if, if we saw it in there. Um, and then finally, I'm prob by this time I've probably already talked to you about mag magnetic arc blow. Remember, as you're coming up, that magnetic field moves with you, and you may find it necessary to increase your rod angle as you get near the top to help to counteract that mag magnetic arc blow. Okay? Otherwise, if you can maintain uh, a, a steady uniform angle all the way up, that's fine. But I think you will find that you'll have to increase the rod angle as you get near the end of the plate. Okay, that's all out of chapter 14. Let's turn to chapter 15. Page 495, we've got about uh, 15 more minutes to go. We're looking at job J44, welding a T-joint. Now this is in the overhead position using 6010. Uh, the T-joint welded in the overhead position is used extensively in shipyard and structural work. Read about the welding technique that they have here and look at their examples. If you look at figure 15.7 down in the lower right hand corner, you can see he's got one affixed up overhead, uh, the same way that we have you do, uh, doing it in, in the welding lab. And you notice his rod angle and notice how he's positioned so that he's nice and comfortable and has good control over the welding electrode. And then note under figure 15.6 at the bottom of the page, his rod angle that he's using. Very important. Uh, flip the page and look at the checklist now. Uh, on page 497 it says checklist. After you are able to make welds that are satisfactory in appearance, make up a test specimen similar to that made in job 13J14. Use the plate thickness, welding technique, and electrode type and size specified for this job. Weld on one side only. And then you're going to do a break. It says, break the completed weld specimen and examine the surfaces for soundness. The weld must not be porous. It must show complete fusion and penetration at the root of the joint and to the plate surfaces. The joints should break evenly through the throat of the weld. So they're describing a fillet weld break test to you. You don't have to do that uh, because those of you that are going on, we're going we're to certify you later on or give you an opportunity to certify later on. But this is a test that's given by the AWS to, uh, to, make a, to certify you to do fillet welds. And if you want to do this, an experiment, just get with Jeff or I and we'll be happy to monitor that and help you do it correctly so you can judge your own, uh, the, own uh, the quality of your own work. Okay, job 15J45, welding a T-joint. Okay, the, our objective here is to weld a T-joint in the overhead position by means of multi-pass fillet welds using stringer beads. Uh, I have one objection with, with what they're describing in their technique. If you look right to the right of you, uh, where it says second pass A on this fillet weld right here you can see that they've, they've already got their first weld in and then they're putting the second one out here well anytime you're welding in in the overhead position or the or the horizontal position you want to start at the bottom and work up to avoid any slag entrapment so I would object to the way that they're doing this and you see their third pass now has gone down here onto the vertical plate. Let me draw it on the board so I can make myself clear. Uh, 
In the overhead position, doesn't matter if you're using 6010 or 7018, your first bead should come in like so, and your book does that, it comes in like so. Your second bead should come in like so, covering most of this one. And then your third bead comes in like so. That way you avoid any, any uh, overlap or trap slag. Your book, however, shows it just the opposite. It shows this one going in, and then this one going in, and then this one going in. Well, I don't know why they're doing that. I, I, I do not agree with this procedure. As an inspector, I wouldn't allow it because you can get overhang here, overlap, and trap slag in there. Uh, so uh, do not do this in my lab. Uh, I'll have you do it over if I see you doing this. I want it done like this. Once you leave here, how you weld, it's your business. But here, I want you to do it, to do it the proper way, and that is this way. Okay, let's see. Go ahead and read all about that, and then over here on the next column where it says welding technique, I'm up, coming down about halfway into that uh, paragraph, and it says, use the stringer bead technique and deposit each pass in the sequence shown on the job print. You will have difficulty in obtaining the proper proportions, but practice will overcome it. Each bead must be fused with the preceding bead and the plate surface. The face of each layer should be as flat as possible. Uh, practice your starts and stops. Travel from the left to the right and from the right to the left. So from that, I'm taking it that they want you to weld halfway across or so and then come over here and weld halfway across. That's a good technique for avoiding or overcoming magnetic arc blow. So if you want to do that, sure, go ahead and do that. Uh, but if, it, if you're not having trouble with arc blow, go ahead and go continuously from one end to the other. But you keep that in mind. That is allowed. That is allowed. Uh, be sure to remove slag from each bead before starting uh, the next one. And I'm making a note right now in my textbook, and I want you to make a note of this. Um, this traveling from the left to the right and the right to the left, I'm going to make a question out of that and put it on your test. Okay, let's flip the page. Job 15-J46, welding a lap joint. And it's basically the same as a T-joint. We've talked about that uh, before. Drop down to where it says welding techniques, and it says a back and forth whipping motion may be used. Do not extinguish the arc on the forward motion. The whip-like action helps to prepare the root to the joint of the weld deposit by preheating it. It allows the weld pull to cool off so that excessive convexity and spilling are prevented and washes the slag back over the weld deposit. So that, again, they want you to use a, uh, uh, that whipping technique that we're using in there and don't pull away from, from, the, uh, from the plate as you're doing that. Read over this because there will be questions coming out of there and then flip the page to 501 and look at job 47 and it's the same as a single T and what you're going to do here is you're going to weld a lap joint, but we're going to do a T joint, in the overhead position uh, by using 7018. So we're going to do 7018. We're going to do them with 6010 and 7018. And again, I want you to read how they do it uh, and compare it to how we're teaching you. And then under welding technique, I think this is a typo here. Um, about the middle of the paragraph, it says, the slag will be somewhat more difficult to control than with reverse polarity, but they're calling for, re up here above, they're calling for a reverse polarity. Uh, DCEP means direct current electrode positive. That is reverse polarity. And then down here, they're kind of contradicting themselves. So I think they may have meant AC or, yeah, they, may have, they must have meant AC here. I don't, I don't know what that is. Uh, but DCEP does mean reverse polarity, so this is a typo in your text. Uh, let's see. Go to 505, job 49, welding a T-joint. Objective here is to weld a T-joint in the overhead position by means of a multi-pass fillet weld weave bead technique with DCEP and or uh, AC shielded metal arc welding electrodes. Uh, if I worked with you, you know I don't like to, to, to weave anything in the overhead position or the horizontal position. Again, because of uh, you, you get a strange weld profile. Uh, Say you're trying to trying to weave weave in the uh, in the horizontal position. What'll happen is your, your your bead can look like this. It'll slump at the top, and and we call this overlap. Uh, some people will call it cold rope. Those are non That's a non-standard term. But 
this can happen with you. Now there are certain techniques that you can learn that will allow you to go ahead and, and get a good looking bead on there. And that's what your book's going to talk about. But again, while you're in our class, I want you to use stringer beads whenever you're doing a, uh, a horizontal weld or an over, overhead weld like so. Uh, make sure you go ahead and do the stringer beads like so. And, and don't, don't try to do a weed because you can get the same thing here. You can get slumping and it'll be, it'll be low in here and slumped down here. But if you want to practice it, that's fine. Read your book, learn from your book, uh, some of the things that we don't teach you, because there's a lot of things out there. Remember, there's a there's hundred different welding and joining processes. Welding's been around for a long time. Uh, so there's more than one way, again, to, to skin a cat. Uh, let's see. Or it says, second pass, the very last sentence, it says, weave the electrode slightly with a whip-like oscillating action. Remember that, the, that because the electrode is larger, more metal is being deposited in the crater so there is more slag present. Keep the electrode motion within the limits of the weld size to prevent undercut. Then it says, note, it is desirable to get more use out of the plate. A third layer may be applied. Uh, this should consist of stringer beads deposited according to the procedures practiced in um, making four beads, five beads, and six, six beads. So you can go ahead and, w and weld a little more there if you want to. Uh, flip the page, look at 507, and this will be the last one we're going to talk about. And it says, uh, welding a T-joint. Our objective is to weld overhead, multi-pass fillet welds using the weave bead technique again. It says, this joint is used extensively in marine construction, especially barge construction, and in heavy fabrication. It differs from the previous job only in that the size of the electrode is larger, the size of the weld is larger, and more weld metal is carried in each pass. As I mentioned in a previous lecture, most codes, I've never come across a code yet that will let you carry more than a one half inch weld. And when they talk about carry, they talk about the, the thickness, the throat thickness of the weld metal that you're depositing. So, so you're going to carry more metal with a larger electrode, but always keep in mind it can't be over a half an inch, and that's a lot of metal, a half an inch. Uh, welding technique. Uh, it says, maintain a close arc gap, weave the electrode by moving it forward with a rapid whipping motion, and at the same time, lengthen the arc slightly. And again, we're using 6010 rod here. Do not break the arc and return it to the crater when the crater has solidified. This prevents the molten pool from becoming too hot and spilling off. It also preheats the root of the joint ahead of the deposit and forces the slag over the deposit. Because better control of weld metal and arc is possible, undercut, overlap, and convexity are reduced and the appearance is uniform. And then it says, uh, second pass, you're going to use the same technique for the second pass as you did for the first, but more metal is deposited. Uh, you, uh, you will need to practice to increase the deposition. Um, so you, it, you need to pause as needed in order to get the weld size that you want. Then flip the page where it says check, check test on page 508. Again, now they're talking about you can go ahead and do a fillet weld break test and test this if you want to. And it's identical to the test that you did before. You're going to make, it, make a weld, but remember the weld can't be any thicker than the, than the thickness of the plate that you're using. And then we can go ahead and do a fillet weld break test on that and give a visual inspection to examine it. Uh, let me real quickly show on the board what I'm talking about. A lot of times we'll test welders from, from local companies and it's called an appearance test but then we also do two mechanical tests and we'll take a one half inch plate and this comes straight out of the AWS D1.1 structural welding code, bo code book and we'll do a test on a fillet weld just like you guys, are, guys and gals are practicing now and it looks about like this and it's one half inch thick and it's uh, four inches wide. Both these plates are four inches wide and it's eight inches long. And you'll make a weld in here. And it'll, it's usually uh, a 6010 root and maybe you'll put 7018 over top or you can do what your book says and go completely with 6010 or you can do it completely with 7018. And you're going to put your weld in here and then it's going to be a visual test, so an appearance test, so we'll look at it. And we'll look for things. Are all of your craters filled? Do you have any undercut? Do you have excess spatter on it? 
do you have arc strikes? Did you strike, drag your electrode across that plate before you started the weld? All of those are discontinuities. All of those are defects. All of those are points off. And once we do that, once we, once we score its appearance, then, according to the code, we'll go ahead and we'll cut one inch off of each end. And what I like to do is I'll, I'll look at both of those and I'll pick the best one. I'll pick the one that visually, to me, looks like the best one. And then I'll polish that up and I'll cut it with acid. We'll polish that up nice and smooth so you've got a nice smooth surface and your weld is right here. And then we'll, we'll polish it uh, on a sandy belt and then we'll etch it with acid. And what the acid does is it brings out the relief. It lets us see how far you actually burnt into the, into the metal. And that is called a macro etch examination. So remember that name because I'm going to go ahead and put it on the test. This is a macro etch examination and this is called a fillet weld test. And the second part of this test is now we've got six inches in here remaining, right? Once, we, once we've cut off an inch off of each end, we still have six inches. So we're going to take this remaining six inches and we're going to put it in a vise, in a clamp, and we're going to use a sludge hammer and we're going to break it off. We're going to break it in two. And when we break it in two, we'll, we'll take it and we'll examine it. And we'll look, at, we'll look at the weld that you put on there. What's that weld look like? Is it clean? Is there porosity in it? Is there slag entrapment? Did you break that edge down? Is this edge broken down all the way? Or are there spots where it's, where, where it's still a straight line, which would indicate that you didn't break it down all the way? That means you had lack of fusion at the root. That's a defect. That would be a failure. So these are all things that we would be looking for in this examination. So you can see the exa exam consists of three parts. The visual, the macro etch, and the fillet weld break. Fillet weld break test. Remember those terms. So this is what the, the test that your book is describing. If you want to practice that, I'll be happy to, to take you through that and let you test for yourself to see how you're doing. I probably won't use this material because we have to special order it for our tests, but we'll find some scrap material around someplace that we can use and, and go ahead and let you see how that works. But remember those terms, I'm going to put them on your test. That's all for this one. If you have any questions, if I wasn't clear on anything, please get with me or get with Jeff and we'll be happy to talk it over with you. Uh, what you're learning here, it's a good grounding, but it's only the beginning of your, of your education. So read your book, see how other people would do it. Thank you for your attention.